All right. Um, yeah. Welcome to our talk on uh, forging chains, the Java blacksmith. Uh, what you're about to see is joint work uh, yeah, of um, David, who will also be speaking today, then Ruben, who's here in the audience, who won't be speaking today, uh, and then myself, uh, Fabian. Uh, we um, recently uh, founded a company here in Cape Town called uh, Wordy Labs, and we're essentially doing security uh, consulting, but with a heavy focus on uh, bringing in our own uh, code analysis tooling. So essentially, um, we try to be quicker um, by using a lot of the stuff that we've built in, in the past years. Um, what we're going to speak about today um, are Java deserialization vulnerabilities. Now, I mean, that's certainly not a new topic. I think the big um, deserialization, Java deserialization apocalypse was uh, sometime in 2016 uh, with the Wise of Serial work. But um, it's very troubling how uh, people have dealt with the results of this. And that's what we're going to be speaking about today. Um, and for those of you uh, who are not so much in that topic, um, this is just a very simple example um, of what this would look like in the code. So this is the kind of vulnerability we're talking about. This is a, um, it's just a class that uh, has an input stream, an object input stream, and that stream um, that comes from an attacker. So typically, that's um, something that comes in over HTTP, for example. So when you sniff uh, on the interface or when you have your burp connected uh, in, in between uh, your target and uh, your browser, you'll typically see that there's this binary blob in there, but some of those names in there, so some, some um, strings are in there that look like Java types. When you see that, you know that there's a, a Java object sent to the server, and the other side, so the server, is about to deserialize it. right? And so that already um, is a huge problem. So it means that the attacker can now specify whatever object they like, and the other side is going to deserialize it. Now, um, just uh, to clarify that from the beginning, um, this does not mean that the attacker can now just send uh, whatever you know, made up class, you know, just create new code, and then send it over and say, please execute this, right? That's not how it works. Um, but they can load anything that is currently on the class path, so anything that's already inside the application. And this is a setting that's surprisingly similar to uh, you know, what we've seen in memory corruption exploitation, so in the exploitation of, of buffer overflows, for example. Um, right in the, in the start, you know, stack-based buffer overflows, you could actually jump uh, to code that you had just injected, but that ended quite quickly. The stack was made non-executable, so you could no longer include your own code. So all you could do was jump to code that was already there. And you could start chaining little pieces of code to create your exploit, exploit chain, essentially. Um, and um, yeah, this, this technique uh, well, has a few different names. Uh, it's been around for ages. So return to libc, borrowed code chunk technique. And at some point, academia also um, picked this up. Uh, there were a large amount of papers about this. And it all started with this one here, with this beautiful title in 2007, The Geometry of Innocent Flesh on the Bone. Right? So these little code chunks that you use to now exploit the target, that's the innocent flesh. Right? And so each of these gadgets is completely harmless in itself. There's nothing to patch here. Um, they do ex it does exactly what it's supposed to do. But by chaining that now, and due to the vulnerability, due to, due to the ability of uh, you being able to make that first jump, right, it becomes dangerous. And so here's an example of what that looks like in memory corruption. This is from a talk we gave in 2021 uh, on uh, router exploitation. So here you can see some, uh, some uh, gadgets uh, for MIPS. And you can see they always end in uh, jump um, RA, so that's on MIPS, right, and on x86, um, that would be a return. And that's why it's called return-oriented programming. You're looking, at these little, you're looking at these little pieces of code that all end in return. These are now your instructions. These are the instructions for your weird machine, as they say. So it's a machine that's there that shouldn't have been there. That's the idea. And as an attacker, you now have control 
over some of the registers, over memory locations, and where to jump first. That's all. And from that, you build your exploit. Now, in the Java world, we have a very similar setting. So here now, what we look for are serializable classes. These are the things that we can specify. And um, serializable classes in Java, it's not always that easy to, to, to deserialize them again, to, to get them back into a valid state. So um, what you can do is you can install all of these custom handlers that are going to be called when the deserialization happens. And that's your innocent flesh now, right? So these read object functions that you see there in the code, they do some custom stuff. And you can think that all of these functions are what I can call first. And now I want to chain, you know, and now I want to go from here to the next thing. And here's called property-oriented programming. So um, yeah, similar concept. All right, um, yeah, all fields are under your control. So this is similar to the registers in the memory, in the memory corruption case, except for the ones that are marked as transient and the ones that are marked as static. But that's, yeah, technical detail. Um, yeah, that's it. So it's the same setting, um, I would say, but the reactions to this have been completely different, and that's why I think we need to talk about this again. So in memory corruption, things are actually okay, right? So people recognize that if you have a buffer overflow, that is the problem. You know, you need to fix that buffer overflow and nothing else. So I think a good example is the man page of the, of the gets function. So there's a function um, in, in libc called gets, and there's no way of using it without it causing a buffer overflow. It just doesn't do checks. And so now this man page says, because it is impossible to tell without knowing the data in advance how many characters gets will read, and because gets will continue to store characters past the end of the buffer, it is extremely dangerous to use it. Blah, blah, blah. And then at some point it says, oh yeah, in the beginning it says that. Never use gets, right? Just don't do it. Okay? And so here the world is okay. Now in the Java world, it's completely different. In the Java world, this is, this is um, read object itself. They say, warning, deserialization of untrusted data is inherently dangerous and you sh should be avoided. Untrusted data should be carefully validated, right, according to the blah, blah, and this and that, right? So by saying this last part, right, oh yeah, you can still validate this, right? When you go into an audit to a customer and tell them, hey, look, you're, doing, you're, you're using read object, uh, you have a big problem, they'll say, but can't we carefully validate it and things like that? And the answer should be no, right? And this is why we're having this talk today. Um, it gets worse when you move slightly away from read object, right? So there's this thing called HTTP invoker service exporter. And it simply, it, it pretty much takes all of your HTTP endpoints and says, okay, let's use deserialization for this. First it says, okay, this is the recommended protocol for Java to Java remoting, right? And then it says, warning, beware of vulnerabilities due to unsafe Java deserialization. This is already weird because the deserialization is the vulnerability. It's not th that there are vulnerabilities due to the deserialization. And so, yeah, this we don't want. We hope that in 2030, uh, the documentation says, never deserialize attacker control Java objects. You might as well use gets or do heroin. Right? <laughs> um, and then you hear people say, but all the known chains, they're patched. So can I please deserialize my data? And there's a bit of a fetish in the Java world about deserializing data. You know, you have RMI, that was a big story. And essentially this idea of, oh, we have all of these computers, we just program them as if they were one, and we don't care about the fact that, you know, they're actually other computers, right? That's where this comes from. They really want to deserialize data, and now we kind of broke all of that, right? That's the problem. Now, in memory corruption, there's been this long stream of research which is uh, where people show, okay, here's a generic way of exploiting a buffer overflow, and then they started hardening the heap, right, to make all the stuff, um, yeah, harder to exploit, to essentially patch the chain, patch the way of exploiting this. But nobody in their right mind would say, on, uh, oh, the heap is hardened now, uh, we don't have to patch buffer overflows anymore, right? Nobody would say that. But in the Java world, that's exactly what's happening. Right. So, overly confident, we stated, um, you know, it's just super easy to find chains, right? Let's just uh, tell besides Cape Town that we can find these chains. Right, and uh, well, 
then we got kind of scared because it's actually not that easy. And the talk was selected, so now we're here. Um, oh, oh, and uh, luckily, we found the chains, so that's good. Right? <laughs> um, but uh, I have read an awful amount of Java code, and it was quite traumatizing. <laughs> All right. Um, this thing went off, so I have no idea about the time. Um, so the way we got started is to look at chains that existed in the past. Um, and there's the Wise for Serial projects, that, that's the one from 2016. And you'll find a lot of nice chains there, but they all don't work anymore. And that's not because they were bad to begin with, that's because people started introducing patches, you know, just to make sure that that stuff uh, doesn't work anymore. Um, and so I'll show you one of those chains. Um, which is called the Groovy One Chain, just so you get a bit of a feel of um, you know, how do these chains actually work. And then we'll look at how they patched it. So um, yeah, you have this chain of priority queue, comparator, converted closure, method, closure, method. And we'll look at each one of them really briefly. So a priority queue, as the name says, is a queue where some elements have, have some sort of um, priority over other elements. That means you need to be able to compare the elements in that. Now, if you have a queue like that, you want to reconstruct it, you are going to have to check whether um, the order is still correct. So you need a comparator, and the comparator is going to have to be called on deserialization. So that little E that you see here, that's the comparator that you can include. So you know that if you take a priority queue and you ask somebody to deserialize it, your comparator.compare function is going to be called. So that's the first chunk in your exploit chain, the first gadget. Second gadget is Java dynamic proxies, and that is a really weird thing, but um, the way it works is, um, in Java you can actually have a class definition um, generated on the fly, you know, as the deserialization happens, and as an attacker you can specify which interfaces it's supposed to implement, comparator in this case, and um, you can say which invocation handler is supposed to be called every time a call is made to any of these methods of that interface, right? So it's a proxy in the sense that you get to catch all the calls and give them to your handler. And so that's the second thing we use. We create this proxy and we pass it on to the third gadget, which is the converted closure. And the converted closure it's just one of those invocation handlers, so a function that catches all the calls and then um, calls a closure. What's a closure? It's a fancy word for a function in Groovy. Right? So now we can call Groovy functions, essentially, closures. And then there's a closure that allows you to call any method, Java method, or the method closure. And so now you intercept that and then pass it on to any method again, right? And that's the entire chain. Um, yeah, there's a look, comment there in the code. It'll become interesting in a moment. Um, but yeah, that's essentially how it works. So now, when we look at the patch, that's really crazy. That really blew my mind. Of course, they, you know, you can't just patch out these different gadgets because actually they do exactly what they're supposed to do. So they only patched out one of the gadgets which is this method closure. They said, yeah, method closure is a closure, so it needs to be serializable, but we can't think of any you know, legitimate reason to ever do that, so maybe let's just throw an exception when somebody tries to do that, right? And that's what happened here, right? So, so here you have the patch. The patch is also wrong. So the patch now says, you can still choose to deserialize this if you want to, then you can set a variable called allow resolve, and then you will deserialize the object, but in either case, you throw the exception. So <laughs> even though they still enabled it for legitimate use, it's obvious that nobody's using this because otherwise they would have noticed that you cannot use this anymore, right? So this is now broken. Um, it's broken for attackers. It's broken for everyone at this point, right? That, that was the patch. Um, and um, yeah, so that one was removed. But the first three gadgets are fine. We tried them out. They work fine. No problem with that one. So then we thought, does that mean that we can still call any Groovy method? Um, and we then looked for, well, Groovy closure. We looked for different closures. 
And um, I found one that just says print line, right? So that we could just see, can we print anything we like? Um, and then we started, we, we used that gadget chain, we plugged in that print line closure, and we got an exception. And it said, no signature of method, um, they want to call do call, and they want to put two arguments in there, which is foo and bar, but um, all we have is a do call function with one argument. So that doesn't work. So then you think, okay, well, then I'll just use one argument. Well, the problem is the arguments that you see here, foo and bar, so those are the elements in a priority queue. If you only have one argument, then the comparator is never called because you don't have to compare one element with anything, right? You, you need at least two arguments. So at that point, that seemed broken. So we thought, okay, is there, is there another gadget that we could find here that would resolve the situation for us? And so what we need is a method that is called with two arguments, right? Two arguments because something needs to be compared, um, and receives a closure, and then calls that closure only on one of the arguments, or on one at a time. And you actually don't have to read a lot of code to come up with the answer here, but the truth is I read a lot of code until I <laughs> eventually found out, and then I thought this is really, this, you should have thought of this. And the answer is order by. All right, so if you call order by on something, then the thing that you're gonna be passing in is some function that's supposed to uh, do the ordering, and that one is only evaluated on one of the things, right? It's just, it gives, it assigns a number to the thing that you're going to be ordering. And yes, it's a comparator, right? And so here you see the code of order by, you can see it's a compare function, like we want to call, and you can see it has a closure, and it calls the closure once on the first object and once on the second object. And now it's bridged, now it works. Now the whole thing is open again. Now we can call any groovy closure with either one argument or two arguments. Also with three now, because the limitation with two was only there because we need at least two to call the comparator. Right, and so this is the code that will um, create a serializable object called Q. And if you write that Q out, you take that binary blob and you give it to that server, it will output you are owned, right? So that was the first working exploit. Now, I hear you saying, okay, well, now you can only print stuff, who cares? Um, there are a lot of closures in there, like a lot. Um, in Groovy, pretty much everything is a closure. So here's a nice one. Um, I just grabbed over the code a bit to just find a few nice ones. So this one allows you to set any system property. That's very interesting because we have another gadget that would work if we were able to set a system property. I'm not gonna show you that one now, but um, the point here being, um, you can use this to control all sorts of things where normally you would say, well, this can be trusted, right? Now suddenly you cannot trust your system properties anymore. Or this one here, it will load an arbitrary class and call the nullary constructor on it. Right, so now you can execute any static initializer block and any constructor with uh, zero uh, arguments. And usually in these uh, static initializers, if you can only call a static initializer, that's not much fun because you don't control any of the input. But together with this one where you can set the system properties, now you control system properties that are often processed within those static initializers. So you can see this gets worse and worse. The more code you read, <laughs> well, the, the worse it gets for the target and for yourself, right? I mean, it, it just gets worse and worse, right? Um, and then this last one here, um, you can add URLs to your URL class, class loader. This means you can say, oh, there's another jar over there, right? This also contains nice code that you might want to load, right? So this is, this is definitely um, dangerous stuff, I would say. And, uh, warrants saying that, uh, well, you know, this is not patched, right? You, you can't just take out the method closure and then, and then that's patched. Any, anybody can come along, uh, get another um, gadget, and, um, and the whole thing is open again, right? And so what I'm trying to tell you is, um, in real, well, first of all, as I said, you can, you can call a lot of these closures in real code bases, you can also call the closures of the actual application. 
you're not limited just to the library. So anything that somebody writes, you, you got to think of this like this. You're programming, and any closure you write, you have to uh, you have to think about okay, what happens if an attacker just calls this? Right? I mean, that's insane, right? <laughs> um, and when you look at the chain, it, it's only two elements: the priority queue and the order by. And both of these, both of these gadgets, they do exactly what they're supposed to do. There's nothing to patch here. The only thing with patching here is like our general attitude towards usage of read object. All right, over to you, David. All right, so um, I'm David. Uh, and now where we come in is how do we do this at scale? So. Fabian read a lot of code, and much of it is what I gave him. Um, but this is sort of the journey of the research and development of this tool and starting with the research. So we have this cauldron of things that lead to these chains, we'll create these chains. And one thing we really were exploiting a lot in these gadget chains and being able to call stuff like comparator and you know, if someone overrides compare, it's all these little methods that come along with you know, object or other things that you're implicitly uh, inheriting. And this is gonna sound a lot like a CS 101 lecture, but um, yeah, it might not be obvious that something is serializable. Again, you know, there's long chains of, on the hierarchy, but uh, anything that happens to inherit serializable is a payload for us. Um, so that is essentially one of our sources. And um, a lot of, uh, in, in these groovy closures, you see a lot of side effects being called um, method calls being jumped to here and here. It's a lot of uh, classes that aren't initially serialized, and especially with the proxies, you know, you can start to manipulate things uh, dynamically. And a simplified example that's very popular in this is also um, something from Clojure. So if you thought Groovy was bad, it happens everywhere else. Um, so the Clojure language had these, uh, also instead of calling them Clojures, they're like these functions, and these were all serializable as well. And um, highlighted are sort of the important parts of it. So you have the abstract table model, which uh, has a bunch of closure functions, and it overrides hash code. So already we have a magic method. Um, and then we start to pretty much anything that inherits function is uh, more potential payloads. And in a simplified way, the hash map or the payload example on the left shows what the kind of vulnerability you're going to construct looks like. So we wrap it in a hash map because we know that we want to call hash code. And when you're reconstructing a hash map, it, all the keys need to be hashed again. So it'll then call whatever in our attacker controlled um, closure function map field. Uh, that will start to have then all of its values hashed. And what we defined that behavior was is invoking everything in I function. And one of those invokes a value, and one of those is a value. So we just set the value to our payload and say, use the executor. Um, and similarly, there was a patch on one of the gadgets to make it uh, throw an exception. Um, and you can see the sort of pattern forming of, you can, you have the rest, they're still serializable, but there's one that you can't. And uh, you can still do a lot of other interesting things. Um, another one that was briefly touched on was reflection, um, and there are many forms of this kind of uh, behavior that we can reach via serialization, deserialization. Uh, but briefly, Java reflection uh, allows us to read write to fields, but also execute methods using references. Um, newer versions of Java, they limit uh, what you can use reflection on built in, but um, Ultimately, you can still change, you open a you know, hex editor and you can still manually write things. And um, an example on the right is one class that controls, um, well, they're serializable and uh, gives us a bunch of hooks into a side effect that will declare methods. We can say, define the method, we can define the class, we can define the command. And uh, the non-serializable class can be our target. So. Um, you know, maybe you have a predefined dictionary of uh, a bunch of classes that can do this, and then you just uh, generate a whole bunch of bar classes that have those various payloads and see what comes out. Um, method proxies, this was something that was brief briefly touched on, so it does get worse. Um, <laughs> there's a more uh, sort of uh, in-depth example on the right where 
or you, you really need, the main limitation of this is you need the interface. So, for example, we have a foo interface and we have a foo object instance. And we're going to wrap that object with the proxy so that any calls in that object are going to have be proxied. And as we've also seen, some of these handlers can be attack controlled or serializable, so we can define a lot of that behavior. <laughs> but then they said, this is too limiting. We want to handle any class. So that's where cglib comes in, and that allows us to instrument the bytecode dynamically. So you're effectively rewriting code while the program's lifespan is happening, and um, you know you get things like aspect-oriented programming that you see in uh, Spring, Spring AOP, and you, you know that's used for injecting dependencies and that kind of stuff, and that's really cglib running in the background. So if you have Spring on your class path, you have cglib on your class path, and you better hope that Spring isn't deserializing attack control data. So now that we have a few ingredients, um, how are we going to actually approach designing uh, sort of mass automation of these kinds of things? So one of the constructs we depend on is the type hierarchy because, again, it's an object-oriented program, so we need to model the classes, interfaces, polymorphism, all that kind of stuff. And um, this is more about ingredient one, where we need to understand uh, what our possible callers are. Uh, a lot of these chains follow call trees and stacks, and we need to be able to sort of uh, follow those. And this is a little example of um, some Java. This is some standard CS 101 kind of stuff. So we have class A, which implicitly uh, extends object, which means it also extends hash code, two string, uh, et cetera. So that's already on that class. And then you have B extends A, doesn't overwrite anything, so it's effectively some kind of um, duplicate, and then final class uh, C. And final means you can't inherit from C, and it overrides foo, so um, that's a whole new call in the uh, call graph. And that brings us to the call graph. Um, so before we head on to what that example looks like in the call graph, let's look at the three sort of main uh, method invocations we want to model. So static is pretty pretty chilled. It's kind of like C, you know, you only have one instance. You have a class, and you say call this function. And it's pretty easy to validate, and from compile time, you see there's only one call that can be made. Virtual comes from object instances. Object instances is where a lot of this hierarchy stuff comes in. You're inheriting different methods, and if you're defining a parameter that's really high up in the hierarchy, it could refer to a call from anyone who inherits it. But at the same time, it's still a finite set. We can still look at all the classes that we inherit from it and say it's maybe one of these five calls. But with reflection, ingredient two, we can write code on the fly. Um, that call could go to code we define at any point. So this is a little bit trickier to uh, model. And how do we analyze the call graph for the example? So let's use an example of this main uh, function. It takes in the three types as the parameters and calls foo in all of them. Um, and let's just also use, uh, define some components. So the call sites are the callers, the targets, the callees um, are the methods, and we need a type hierarchy on top of this to define or see what is that finite set of things we can call in the case of virtual um, calls. So yeah, we're going to have multiple callees. That's one challenge. Reflection is difficult because we have to potentially track arguments that go in there, but we can also approximate certain calls. An example of something we approximate is that when you call default read object, you're calling read object in all your fields. Um, we can draw that line manually. Um, and also, this representation of its own, of just calls, is not a call graph, uh, not a control flow, it's not a data flow graph, so we just see a bunch of calls. Um, so it's not very precise. But um, it does tell us a lot and is a good starting point. Um, and here's just an example of that source code and the kind of thing we'll see in the call graph. So the first two will call uh, both foos, or potentially both foos. Uh, we don't know unless we see um, what is actually given to main. But C, it's pretty safe to assume it just calls foo.c and no one can inherit from C. So yeah, that's a simple, simple one. But you can see once we traverse these chains, there can be quite a state explosion. Um, as they sort of fork onto many potential calls. So do we have enough to sniff out gadget chains? Well, again, one challenge we don't have is flow. So we could, on the path, uh, on, in, the, in the code on the right, we have a bunch of attacker control data being serialized, but when we look at something like that sanitizer function, can we statically verify that it is 
being 100% sanitized, or can we still get to that far right? Um, and that's a sort of the challenge of static analysis and false positives and all that kind of thing. Um, but it is also a bit more expensive to start doing that kind of analysis. Um, but we do have Yearn. So Yearn is sort of the uh, big open source project that we maintain, and it is a really granular static analysis tool that can do taint, ana taint analysis. Uses a graph database, and you can write like really nice queries um, to see what's happening in the program and also model flows. But it is very expensive. It's very granular, um, and you know when you start to call these magic methods like hash map and stuff like that, you're really going deep into the JDK, and if you have all of that in your analysis, you've got gigs in memory. So let's not go there yet. Um, and a lot of these chains can be much deeper than, say, four calls deep. So, starting f you know, from scratch, let's see what we can do um, for B-sides. So, this is where I wrote Ruben in. I said, Ruben, we've got to make a tool um, that can find chains. And we basically ingest bytecode, and we iterate around it and say, are there any missing types? You know, that we haven't seen, are they on the class path? You know, this will often be the JRE classes, and we just sort of recursively get these dependencies in. We construct the gadget graph, which is just the type hierarchy and call graph. We look at the payloads, which are serializable classes with controllable fields and potentially side effects in the read object behavior. And then our syncs will be our like runtime exec and all that kind of stuff, or maybe the start of a new gadget. Um, we perform a breadth-first search, and we have these, you know, basically just call graph chains. But they're not very precise, so we give that subset of the program to Yearn, and we say, can you please validate if these are true or not? And then we have a nice list of refined chains that are potentially exploitable. Um, and this is where we present one of the big exploits that we found. Um, again, the notion of this is, it's not a vulnerability, um, but if you do have this uh, artifact on your class path and you read deserialized data, uh, here's something fresh. Um, status undisclosed, but I did also try Google, and no one has assigned any CVEs to this, so consider this um, a Christmas gift from us to you guys. So what, about, uh, what is ZK? So they describe themselves as the best open source Java framework for building enterprise web and mobile apps. They say enterprise twice here, so you know it must be big. Uh, in this slide, they say enterprise another two times and uh, describe that JavaScript is bad, and they do this business logic on the server side. So the server side, UI is generated and given to the client. Um, cool. Our report lit up, and I was like, hey, Fabian, something looks pretty fishy here. And he pointed out, yeah, there's a lot of weird serializable classes here that's called like scripts and sessions that are serializable, interpreters that are serializable. Um, and then I was like, okay, let's look at the docs. So the docs have this, uh, describe this feature, this, this these script tags. Everything is kind of like this XML or HTML extension, and you can define, you know, custom behavior that generates um, UI elements. And we've seen this kind of templating before. Um, but usually there's sort of like tags and they have all four loops and that kind of thing. Um, but Z, uh, Zscript is pretty hardcore. They're like straight up any language you want, you know, Python, JavaScript, write like a whole, you know, sub program within your, your, your script. So cool. Um, what's the catch? Well. And we looked at the page implementation class, which renders most of the uh, UI elements. And we found that they just, again, like the Java docs said, uh, it's serializable, but don't. Just don't do it. Um, so it's like, it's a good place to start. Um, and when you looked at the deserialization hook, there was a lot going on and a lot of side effects. And this was great. So starting at top, default read object, all fields are just you know, straight up deserialized no checks, and then they have addition, they expect additional um, bytecode. One of them is the language that you want, so we're telling them what language you want to execute. Uh, they do a lookup uh, if they have a language definition and an associated interpreter for that. Um, but you can also send interpreters to it, tell it which objects that on the class path uh, you want to interpret for certain languages. And this renders the page, so it immediately executes those interpreters on the scripts that are also tag controlled. And for looking further into this, yeah, I mean, that's just code execution, right? So let's craft our payload. Um, it wasn't as simple as choosing your own language. Um, Bean shell was the only serializable interpreter, uh, but that's still fine. Um, we could use a lot of built-in defaults and nulls in a lot of places. Um, they're quite null tolerant. And we could say, 
here's some Java. Um, we want to execute Java. Use this bean shell interpreter for Java when you see it. And um, there were some things we had to set because otherwise, you know, they don't expect some, everything to be null, but some, you know, so we set some basic parts. And um, you think, okay, if I use ZK, surely I can disable execution. And well, yes, you can. Um, it is enabled by default, and as we showed, if you have Groovy in the class path, we can also control system properties. So just don't put those two in the class path. Um, and actually, let me go to the demo. So let's see if I can uh, increase that font size. Okay, that's the shortcut. Uh, let's see. In any case, let's hope that is good. Um, but just the basic description we have on the build, the latest version of um, ZK. And known for the vulnerabilities, as you can see, there's something unrelated on the class path that they bring in um, transitively. But this essentially all just uh, is Java reflection writing the payload that I described. And we're going to open the calculator. Um, so let's run that. It is going to generate a file, payload.bin. Now we have payload.bin, and we see all these Java words and stuff come up, and a bunch of uh, nulls and whatever. Uh, let's look at the read. So the read is straight up um, file input stream, input, uh, object input stream, and the big bad read object. So let's read that, and we've got an ex yeah, we've got a calculator. And one thing about these, um, uh, you know, big enterprise. You know, um, frameworks that advertise the clients. But in this instance, they're also advertising potential victims. So if you want the payload, I can send it to you. You can start sending it to these guys, maybe, you know, see what comes back. <laughs> just like, um, plug it, yeah, just see what happens. Um, and yeah, so with conclusion, um, patching the code doesn't really make sense. Again, it is like a buffer overflow. Um, signing CVEs doesn't make sense, uh, which is maybe why the ZK thing doesn't have a CVE yet or whatever. But um, you know, one could also ask, why don't they just write all that to uh, a JSON file or protobuf file? Um, and yeah, we, didn't, we decided not to do vendor communication because it's not really a vulnerability. Every, the file, you know, the, the page renders the page, and it's doing exactly what it does. But um, if you're going to read objects, then that's a problem. And we didn't find that ZK automatically reads objects, so that still needs you know, extra gadgets or you to actually intentionally read objects. Um, so our position is that it's too easy to craft new chains. Um, and we found a whole bunch. We can only present so many in this talk. Um, we have yeah, some more if you want to talk to us afterwards. Um, and are there vulnerabilities that can't be exploited? Um, like the old YSO serial ones that did get patched? Um, yes, some of them are no longer uh, you know, available for us to exploit on uh, the newer versions of those libraries. But that's also true for buffer overflows. Um, not all of them work the same ways that they used to. But generic chains are not needed. Um, Application-specific ones work just as well. And a lot of these uh, are open source projects. ZK is open source, so I could also um, read it. But and one thing our tool does do is also, in the report, give us uh, decompile Java. So that's the benefit of um, when I had to look at all of the whole data set that Ruben mined from Maven. You know, not everything was open source, but we could decompile it. Um, and ultimately, calling read object is a vulnerability. As you can see, we can do some pretty wild stuff. Um, and with that, we are open to questions. Um, here's some more further reading. Uh, if you'd like at the bottom of work in this field in academia and other hacker conferences, check out Yearn. It's open source. You can build your own gadget tool. Um, and yeah, that's it. Cool. Any questions? Sure. Um, were the other were the other 
Here we go. Yeah, so I noticed that they patched out, um, or well, they threw an exception for the one method call in the Yo serial chain. Um, can you tell us about how they patched the other chains? That, that's sort of what I'm curious about. Was it, was it equally as like? Um, yeah, I think like so. You yeah, so I, I reviewed quite a few of the YSO serial ones, and um, a lot of the times people try to um, make the entire class non serializable, but that's not always possible because um, you might be inheriting from some interface that just needs, uh, or some, some base class that just needs to be serializable. So for that closure that you saw, closure you know, is serializable, right? So all closures are serializable. So the only thing you can really do is throw that exception. Um, the patches in general are pretty soft, I would say. Um, and it's quite common that uh, only one particular piece in that chain is patched. And I think that's also because the code is actually doing what it's supposed to do, right? So you're just, you're just cre uh, creating these small differences that don't impact the functionality much, but essentially um, sp uh, target that particular exploit. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Do you, so a lot of this work was manually finding alternative change, right? Like you had to actually search through the stuff. Um, I, I think analogously with the ROP chains, at this point we are having, <clears throat> just from what I read, we're having like symbolic execution automatically spit out ROP chains. Is that where this is going, you think? Yes, yeah, so a lot of the, uh, ideally our follow-up work would be either to, for example, um, we're using Dataflow to validate, or st static analysis to validate, but there have been other approaches that fuzz. There have been approach, approaches that use um, symbolic execution. Um, and there's also another aspect of automatically um, patching these. So CG look could be used for good <laughs> in that case. Yeah, so that's kind of the future work we want to look at this um, in this direction. Okay, thanks. Thank you.